question and answer period at a book signing in NYU's Casa Italiana, an elderly, elegant woman at a table in the room asked the author, when was it exactly your grandmother and great-grandmother reached Auschwitz? June 30th, 1944, the author replied. Oh, the woman began to say, her eyes roaming the room in a middle distance gaze. That was two months after I arrived there. In saying this, a silver cuff, modern, sculptural, slid along the woman's wrist, which she readjusted, as well as a sheer scarf draped about her shoulders. They were killed the day they arrived, the author stated. The woman who'd asked the question nodded with this news, knowing she'd not met the two women who arrived that day after their five-day transport from Fossili, the infamous Italian holding facility from which Italian Jews were sent to Auschwitz. Maybe as a fellow inmate, she'd remembered hearing in the distance the arrival of their train, perhaps spotting the two women as just another pair of figures on a marched walk to the lethal showers, likely never imagining she'd be referencing them decades hence in a comfortable university room in Manhattan. I don't think many of us believe there are such survivors among us still. People so engaged with life today, they had appear at a book signing in Greenwich Village to learn more about a past in which they themselves had starring roles for which they hadn't auditioned. Who put on makeup, a, a tailored jacket, interesting jewelry, and find a seat in a room to listen to someone talk of their family. The author, an ebullient, gracious Italian Jewish woman born in 1927, spoke about her grandmother and great-grandmother, quoting from eight letters her grandmother had smuggled out of Fossili. Those two women, aged themselves at the time, languished for weeks in a limbo of unremitting anxiety. Before their final transport, the younger woman pleading in those missives to neighbors in turn for basic sundries. A package of clothes, sugar, cookies, and canned goods she'd written in letter number two. We have nothing, not even toiletries, writing paper and envelopes, soap, drinking glasses, cutlery. The room in which the presentation was held was so full I stood at the threshold and turned off the lights so a slideshow of images could be better seen. The author acknowledged my simplest of actions with a nod of thanks, and suddenly my wish to connect with, acknowledge the two women from the here and now was realized. Black and white photos of mother and daughter in the 19 aughts and beyond projected onto the wall, holding the hands of children, wearing hats festooned with feathers, crossing a bridge in Padua, posed beneath a tree ringed by boys in sailor suits. Family photographs betraying no hint of a future even Dante couldn't have conjured. I don't think it's possible for language to be more effective than that expressed in those translated letters. We are weak. It's so hot. I'm counting on you, on everyone, especially as regards Mama, reads letter seven. She is my greatest worry. If I were on my own, I would be stronger and freer. There would be no later on, as we learned. And yet, there is a later on. For here, we were our learning about the lives of two women, not just their last days, but earlier, happier ones too, as well as the lives of survivors. The author, whose girlhood odyssey of escape began once racial laws were enacted in 1938. And that 
of a woman in the audience who had not escaped, but was able to tell a room full of strangers now a fact about her entire life, uttered as a simple aside about a trip she was once forced to take. We applauded the presentation, lights up. The woman from the audience, unknown yet famous, gathered herself and walked out onto 12th Street, repositioning her scarf against the autumn chill. A figure from history rejoining the life of our city. <laughs>